Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're very, very pleased to have another one of our seminars. This time, a hybrid one. So we've got an audience here in London as well as an audience online, and it's very good to welcome you. If you're not already a member of the Anglo Turkish Society, then we encourage you to, to write to contact. You can see it on our website, and um, uh, you can become a member. You can also become a life member if you want, which is a very good deal. Anyway, we move to our, our seminar for today. <laughs> Which is a uh, uh, budget that we all thought about a lot, and we used to talk about a lot, a great deal, yeah. in the 1980s and 1990s. So it's gone a bit quiet recently, which is usually an excellent time to revisit um, uh, such issues. And our speaker kindly was explaining to me before we started that the archives have recently yielded rather rich material. And so, in fact, there are many reasons to, to, to revisit this topic. Um, I think that's enough for me. We'll have a normal presentation from the speaker and then questions. And so we're very, very well pleased to welcome Dr. Uh, Rich Yoli uh, to speak on Anglo-Fish Relations 1939 to 1980 and the Cyprus Strife. So thank you very much. Indeed. Well, thank you, Dr. Shanton, for your very kind opening words. And thank you, Craig, for finding me mm -hmm. and inviting me. To this lovely my pleasure I used to talk about Anglo my book, Anglo Turkish Relations, 1939, 1980, and the Cyprus Strife. Here's the book. Right. So this was originally my doctoral thesis, which was eventually published last April, the year old. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members of the committee, for coming here this evening, and I also welcome those of you who have joined through Zoom. Um, it is a real privilege to be with you today. And I, my thoughts and prayers to all earthquake victims in Turkey and Syria. Now, my lecture this evening will be based on a chronological narrative, which I have supplemented with quotations and extracts. To illustrate the events. Part one will be about Turkey and Anglo-Turkish relations and part two will deal with the Cyprus strife. And I really hope you will enjoy the time we will spend together. In this first section we shall examine the diplomatic skills used by British and Turkish diplomats and ministers which eventually led to the signing of the Treaty of Alliance on the 19th of October 1939 between Turkey, Britain and France. At the end of the First World War, British Prime Minister Lloyd George's pro-Greek policy failed to improve pre-war relations with Britain and Turkey. On the 24th of July 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne was signed abolishing the capitulatory regime in Turkey. This meant that nothing stood in the way of resuming relations with Britain. Three ambassadors, three British ambassadors in Ankara in the mid twenties and early and mid thirties had thus made enormous efforts at the diplomatic level, creating a better atmosphere in their relations with the Turkish government. And as Dr. Andrew Mango wrote in his article, Turkey in Winter, British diplomats can claim some credit for repairing Lloyd George's mistakes. Sir Ronald Lindsay Sir Ronald Lindsay was a little Turkey from 1925 to 1926. He was one of the greatest talents in the diplomatic service and as a foreign office official he had been involved in the Lausanne negotiations. He had also led the negotiations to resolve the Mosul question and on the 6th of June 1926 the Treaty of Ankara was signed by Turkey, Britain and mandatory Iraq marking the beginning of a real improvement in relations between Britain and the new Turkey.
the same treaty separated the Kurds of Iraq from those of Turkey, putting an end to any idea of an autonomous Kurdistan. Thereafter, Anglo-Turkish relations became at first normal and then slowly friendly. Sir George Clark, I'm afraid we don't have a picture, but we'll have one in the future. So Sir George Clark, who was ambassador to Turkey from 1926 to 1933, was a career diplomat and presided over a gradual but very real rapprochement between Britain and Turkey. The embassy was still a difficult post and one false step could have done serious damage. On one famous occasion, Sir George Clark delighted the whole of Turkey and his foreign colleagues by an abruptly turned compliment. The diplomatic body had gathered at a state reception. President Atatürk, annoyed by a French journalist's prophecy that his death would leave his nation leaderless, exclaimed indignantly, if I die, there would, there would, if I die, there are a thousand Turks who can take my place. Excellence, replied the British ambassador, who was exagéré mille fois. Excellency, you exaggerate a thousandfold. On the Turkish side, Ahmet Ferid Bey was appointed ambassador to London from 1925 to 1932. Although he arrived at a difficult time, he managed to break the ice and make useful contacts. Munir Ertegün replaced him in 1932 until 1934 and continued the good work until he was succeeded by Feti Okyar who resigned in 1931. <coughs> and Feti Okyar, by the way, was Ataturk's best friend from the military high school in Monastir, now in northern Macedonia. And his appointment to London marked the Turkish president's desire to restore friendly relations with the British government. Sir Percy Lorraine, Sir Percy Lorraine succeeded Sir George Clark and became head of the British Embassy from 1933 to 1939. He reacted very bitterly when asked to go to Ankara. All I can say is that Ankara is not the destination of my ambition. I feel I deserve a better fate than transfer to the wilds of Anatolia. If anyone deserved a penance, Lorraine wrote, let him live in Ankara. And the more he saw of Ankara, the more he wanted to live in the fascinating city of Istanbul. He also intensified his efforts after Ataturk expressed his fears about the rise of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. It was thanks to these efforts that Anglo-Turkish relations became closer and cordial. The 17th of June, on 17th of June, 1934, Sir Percy was invited to a banquet at the Ankara Palace Hotel in honour of the Shah of Persia, who was on a state visit to Turkey. Now, the Ankara Palace uh, Hotel was an official state guest house and was also used for international meetings, and the Shah of Persia stayed there. And Ataturk used to go and relax after speaking in Parliament. Mm. He used to say that the Ankara Palace was a window opening from the east to the west. This is what Sir Percy reported to the Foreign Secretary Sir John Simon, and which is known as the game of poker. The game lasted until 9 a.m. And at the end of the game, Ataturk asked Sir Percy to stay a bit longer to have a conversation with him. Ataturk told him that he had made an excellent impression on him himself and on the Turkish government the Ghazi, as Ataturk was called, until, I think, 1934, said that he had the greatest esteem for England, that he wished for friendship with England, so why could they not become closer? He also wanted to know more about the British attitude towards Turkey. Sir Percy said he did not think Britain underestimated the value of Turkish friendship, and that he himself appreciated the peaceful basis of Turkish policy 
and its determination to ensure internal economic stability and develop its own resources. The following evening, after a banquet, but this time at the Persian Embassy, Sir Percy was again invited to sit down at the poker table with the Ghazi, who said, you see what our strength is when we play against each other. Imagine how strong we would be if we joined forces. Lorraine waited anxiously for the Foreign Secretary, Sir John Simon, to approve his initiative for his long unofficial talks with Atatürk, who had simply said, let us wipe out all bitter memories since 1914 and start afresh as good, open and understanding friends. As a result of this meeting, Lorraine was authorized to hold informal talks with the relevant Turkish ministers, discuss ways and means of strengthening relations between the two countries. Dr. Sechkin Barish Gunez, in his article, Do Diplomats Matter in Foreign Policy? Sir Percy Lorraine and the Turkish British, Turco British Rapprochement in the 1930s, argues that diplomats can make a difference in the conduct of foreign policy by influencing not only the host government, but their own government as well, provided that they find a balance between following orders and using their own discretion, and between their loyalty to the government they represent and responsibility to the receiving um, government. And here's another example to illustrate the above. The unofficial visit of King Edward VIII in September 1936 had a more positive impact on Atatürk and the Turkish nation. Sir Percy's counterpart in London, Ali Fethi Okya, also welcomed the resumption of relations and the visit of the King of England was undoubtedly a positive sign for other diplomatic talks. Gordon Waterfield writes in his book Professional Diplomats of Percy Lorraine that it, this event was far more effective in cementing relations between Britain and Turkey than any academic or high award for attitude. It all started with a king who had chartered the yacht Nalin and decided to hold day in the Mediterranean with Mrs. Wallace Simpson and his party. But sometime later, he had to refrain from calling at Italian ports when Anglo-Italian hostility arose over the war in Abyssinia. Sir Percy then suggested to the Foreign Office that the King should visit Istanbul instead, which would have been an excellent opportunity to meet the Turkish President. The Turkish government showed great flexibility when the visit was announced as being informal. But as King Edward was the first British king ever to visit Turkey and the first by a European ruler after the German Kaiser in 1898, Atatürk was determined to give him a royal welcome. The king was met by Atatürk who helped him to land by holding his hand when he came ashore, and they drove in an open car, bearing in mind that Atatürk always preferred an armoured limousine. So they drove directly to the British consulate, and Lord Kinross wrote, psychologically, the visit changed the attitude of the Turkish people towards Britain, whom they had regarded as an enemy since the outbreak of the war. On the 10th of December, 1936, Edward VIII had abdicated the throne so that he could marry Mrs. Wallace Simpson, the divorcee, and became known as Duke of Windsor, and his brother, Prince Albert, became King George VI. Um, Philip Ziegler, in his book, Edward VIII, points out that Atatürk had said during King, Edward's, King Edward VIII's visit that he would lose his throne because of Mrs. Simpson. All the above events and incidents show that the Anglo-Turkish rapprochement was progressing in a healthy way. It was high time to intensify the slow progress in Anglo-Turkish economic relations. Sir Percy was aware that something had to be done to reduce economic dependence on Germany. This also meant that he had to take on more responsibility in this area 
and try and find ways to liberalize trade between Britain and Turkey. At the end of 1936, the British company Brassert had signed a contract for three million pounds to build a large iron and steel works in Karabük, the Karabük Iron and Steel Works, in the northern part of Anatolia, about 200 kilometers north of Ankara. Britain was also invited to invest in public projects, the harbour of Istanbul, tracing the railway line from Diyarbakir to the Iranian border, the building industry and developing the irrigation systems in Anatolia. In May, in May 1937, Prime Minister Ismet Inonu travelled to London to attend the coronation of King George VI with armaments credits and economic aid in mind. And his visit symbolized the high point of rapprochement between Turkey and Britain. And a year later, on the 27th of May 1938, three credits agreements were signed between Turkey and Britain. According to Dr. Gilmez, Lorraine stands out as a prominent figure who managed difficult relations between the Turks and the British on the brink of the Second World War. Lorraine acted as a confidence builder between Turkey and Britain and was considered one of the few British diplomats who retained the dignity, toughness and realism for which the Foreign Office was once famous. On the 10th of November 1938, Lorraine informed the Foreign Office and the King that Ataturk had died. And the following is what Sir Percy Lorraine declared. Ataturk's reform will be continuous because this reform has enabled Turkey to change completely after the war and this strong nation has no enemies anymore. This is something no other human being has ever achieved in our time. A few months later, Sir Percy Lorraine left Turkey on the 24th of February 1939, and the Times published an article, A Successful Embassy, praising Sir Percy's diplomatic work in Turkey. Anglo-Turkish relations are indeed better now than they have been since the days of Disraeli. The new ambassador, extraordinary and plenipotentiary to Turkey, was Sir Hugh Natchbull Hugerson. He was in Turkey from 1939 to 1944. And here is how Sir Hugh analysed the situation in Turkey on his rival. Atatürk created a new Turkey and set it on solid foundations. His straightforward approach to the powers in 1935 for a revision of the regime of the Straits affords a good illustration. It was pursuance of this policy that he returned to the traditional pro-British orientation. The foundations of Anglo-Turkish alliance were laid in his time. On the 12th of May, on the 12th of May, 1939, on the 12th of May, 1939, negotiations between Turkey and Britain resulted in the Anglo-Turkish Declaration. The idea was to maintain solidarity in the Balkans and prevent a possible German attack. The signing of the Anglo-Turkish Declaration enabled Britain to show the Germans and the Italians that the alliance with Turkey was an accomplished fact. The reason why the Anglo-Turkish Declaration remained bilateral at this stage was that the Franco-Turkish talks on the Sanjak of the province of Alexandretta were not yet over. France joined Britain and Turkey as soon as they signed the Franco-Turkish Declaration on the 23rd of June 1939, the same day that the Sanjak of Alexandretta, which had been declared the Hatay state on 2nd of September 1938, was ceded to Turkey and the Hatay state became the Hatay province of Turkey in 1939. This was greeted with great relief in London. On the 23rd of August 1939, the Soviet Union and Germany signed a non-aggression pact, also known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And on the 1st of September, 
1939, um, Germany attacked Poland, and two days later, on the 3rd of September 1939, Britain, France, Great Britain, France, declared a war on Germany in response to Hitler's invasion of Poland. On the 25th of September 1939, Turkish Foreign Minister Shikri Sarajol went to Moscow to discuss issues interesting Turkey and Russia. He declared that he hoped to bring good news from Moscow. In other words, the Turks were looking forward to the signing of a Russian Mutual Assistance Pact or a Black Sea Pact to help strengthen Turkey's position as a master of the Dardanelles and also protect the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. During the meeting, Moscow guaranteed that Russia would deny the Germans access to the Black Sea and in return the Russians asked the Turks to remain strictly neutral. Alan Bullock states in his book Hitler and Stalin Parallel Lives, three weeks of argument, three weeks of argument with Molotov in Moscow had failed to persuade the Turkish foreign minister to agree to a treaty closing the Black Sea to the warships of other powers. Molotov, who was well known to be stubborn, had met his match for obstinacy. And it was on board a Soviet cruiser that brought Sarajevo back to Turkey that he learned on the 19th of October 1939 that the Treaty of Alliance had been signed between Turkey, France and Britain. At the beginning of the Second World War, Turkey adopted a non-belligerent stance, stating that its army did not have the necessary armament to participate in a global conflict. On the 17th of February 1941, Turkey signed a non-aggression treaty with its neighbour Bulgaria, which displeased the Yugoslavs, the Greeks, and also the British and Americans. The Turks continued to refrain from entering the war, fearing German reprisals on the cities of Istanbul, Izmir, or Ankara. On the, on the 18th of June 1941, Turkey and Germany signed a non-aggression pact for a period of 10 years. The Americans, who did not like the signing of the pact, stopped all aid delivery strategy for a month. But on the advice of the British, they gradually uh, resumed deliveries. On the 22nd of June 1941, when the German attack on the Soviet Union was announced, Turkey declared strict neutrality. Now I'd like to say a few words about chrome, which is one of the most important and indispensable industrial metals because of its hardness and resistance, resistance to corrosion. A bone of contention between Turkey and the two belligerents, Britain and Germany, was Turkish chrome. Until 1943, Turkey had reserved its chrome production for Britain. However, as the British had not expre expressed a desire to renew the contract, a commercial and diplomatic blunder, Turkey felt free to sign an agreement on the 9th of October 1941 to supply chrome to Germany for 1943 and 1944 in exchange for steel and German war material. The Germans took advantage of their pact with Turkey and sent emissaries such as Dr. Karl Claudius, a German negotiator, and Jacques Benoit Michin, a member of the Vichy government, who is also the, who was also the author of a book on Ataturk. So they sent them to Ankara to conclude economic contracts and obtain permission for the transit of troops, weapons and military equipment to Iraq and Syria. And I'd like to quote the following passage from Sir Hugh's memoirs, Diplomat in Peace and War. I quote, throughout the negotiations I was kept informed and it was of course an understanding with ourselves that the contained, that the contained that the, contain, that the text, sorry, contained the reservation in favour of existing engagements. Thus the Anglo-Turkish alliance retained precedence. They, the Turks, undertook that the German treaty should result in no measure of demobilisation or should German troops or war material be allowed passage through Turkish territory. The, this engagement was loyally observed, although on one occasion 
the Turkish government were subjected, albeit indirectly, to a very outspoken demand for passage of troops and material. And Hugerson continued, on the night when the German commercial talks came to an end, one of the British pressmen, um, journalists, used, uh, pressmen used to go to uh, eat at Carpage's restaurant in town, one of the British pressmen called on the band to play Chrome Sweet Chrome. <laughs> they did so and continued with a tune, I can't give you anything but love, baby. <laughs> By the 20th of April 1944, the Turks had completely stopped their Chrome deliveries to Germany. In mid-1941, Anthony Eden, British Foreign Secretary, visited Moscow to discuss the war and post-war organization of peace and security in Europe and also to talk about Turkey because Turkey was all, all the time worried about the Russians. They were really afraid the Russians would attack Turkey. So they were extremely worried all the time and Sir, um, Sir Anthony Eden went to calm them down a bit. And now the time has come to say a few words about the famous Adana meeting. On the 30th and 31st of January 1943, Winston Churchill travelled for the first time to Turkey for a meeting with President Ismet Inönü in the town of Yenice in southern Anatolia, not far from Adana. The meeting took place in complete secrecy in a railway carriage at Yenice station to discuss Turkey's role in the war. It even escaped the spy service of the German embassy in Ankara from Papen the German ambassador, for example, was key near Ankara. Originally, a meeting had been planned in Cyprus, but President Inunu could not leave Turkish territory without officially appointing an interim president, <coughs> and the plan for the meeting would thus have lost its confidential um, character. On the other hand, the officials in the British delegation were not very enthusiastic about the security measures the Turks had provided for the British Prime Minister. The Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Field Marshal Viscount Allenbrook, the Prime Minister's foremost military advisor, was very surprised when the Turkish Foreign Minister, Numan Menemenci, told him that the whole of Turkey was more than delighted about the visit, although it had been agreed by the two allies to keep it as secret as possible. The Turkish reply was prompt. How can you keep an event like this secret? Of course everyone knows about it. The British continued to have concerns about security, especially as there was a German firm not far from the city of Adena. In Adena, Churchill was able to get an idea of the state of the Turkish army and agreed to supply British and American ammunition to reinforce the army free of charge. On the evening of the 30th, Churchill slept in the Turkish train, and on the morning of January the 31st, Church Churchill declared, dictated a paper, sorry, which he called Conseil Matinal, about post-war security. We need to get rid of the um, pop-ups. Oh. If it's somewhere else, it should disappear. Yeah. Thank you. And these are the Ponce Matinal, which I found at the Foreign Office uh, in the archives, the National Archives. Um, and in most secret cipher telegram, in the most secret cipher telegram, dated the 1st of February, 1943, and transmitted to Downing Street and to President Roosevelt, Churchill wrote, My visit to Turkey was, in my opinion, a great success. I send you the following short note of my conversation with President Inunu and a paper called Morning Thoughts, Posse Matinal, Notes on Post-War Security, which I gave him. I pursued a method of perfect trust and confidence, asking for no engagement, but giving to the utmost of our power. In this atmosphere, the President said that the paper was wholly favourable to his views. I made it clear that I did not wish them to enter the war in any circumstances. 
which would lead to a Turkish disaster, which would be our disaster too. But that when the circumstances were favorable. I was sure it would be in the interests of Turkey to play her part. Everything was said in this sense was accepted with lively accord. I asked them whether they would be troubled with the Germans about my visit. They said they did not care. On the 17th of August, 1943, at the Quebec Conference, the Allies decided not to ask Turkey to enter the war, but demanded that it strictly apply the Montreux Convention by prohibiting the passage of German ships through the straits. At the end of 1943, however, Turkey committed itself to co belligerency with the Allies. The arrival of a British delegation in Turkey in January 1944 was a complete failure. The British were unable to meet the long list of Turkish demands and threatened Turkey with isolation in the post-war world. The Turks, on the other hand, denounced the inadequacy of the arms deliveries, which was contrary to the commitments made by the Allies. This new phase in relations also marked the end of Turkish non-belligerence. There were still some issues to be resolved. In June 1944, the British protested to Turkey against the passage of German ships from the Black Sea to the Dardanelles and the Aegean. This was a, viol this was a violation of the Montreux Convention. The ships, disguised as merchant vessels, were in fact German coast guards and, once in the Aegean, reinforced the German fleet. This, the exchange of diplomatic notes between the British and the Turks concerning the interpretation of the Montreux Convention led to the resignation of Numan Menemindiolu, the foreign minister of the Turkish government, who had coined the term of active neutrality. The Allies could now be satisfied with the measures taken by the government of Shikri Sarajol. And on the 2nd of August 1944, Turkey decided to break off relations with Germany and declared war on Germany and Japan on the 23rd of February 1945. I would now like to say a few words about the Cicero affair. The Cicero affair came to light in 1944. It emerged that information about Operation Overlord, the Allied landings on the beaches of Normandy, was leaking out of the British Embassy and that the Germans were retrieving this secret information. The British ambassador himself, contrary to internal regulations, negligently took home documents that should have been deposited in the embassy safe. The, this negligence had already been committed by Sir Hugh when he was minister of the legation in Riga, Baltic seaport, in the 1930s. The documents were photographed by Eliezer Basna, alias Cicero, Sir Hugh Natural Hugerson's valet, while he slept, bathed, or even played the piano. The resulting films were then sold to Ludwig Moisic, commercial attaché at the German embassy. <coughs> The valet was paid in pounds sterling, which turned out to be forgeries. The compromised material did not reveal the plans for Overlord, as has often been claimed. The paper was declassified in the National Archives add spice to the Cicero case. Sir Hugh does not come out of this episode well. Sir Alexander Kadogan, permanent secretary of the Foreign Office, wrote in his diary in 1945, Sir Hugh should of course be court-martialed. In 1950, Foreign Office Minister Hector McNeill noted, what is even more astonishing and equally disturbing is the fact that Sir Hugh Natchbull Hugerson was subsequently employed in Brussels as ambassador. Bear in mind that Eden was his best friend. Mm -hmm. The declassified papers also suggest that Sir Hugh spent much of the rest of his career trying to clear his name of the consequences of the Cicero revelations. There's not one single word in his memoirs about this episode. Not one single word. Robert Denniston writes in his doctoral dissertation that it is the to conclude that the Cicero material 
help the British after all the translations, the ciphers and the reciphers to break the diplomatic code Flora Dora used by the Germans, also known as keyword. And Flora Dora should not be confused with Floro Dora, which, which is an Edwardian musical comedy. <laughs> Oops. With the end of the war, a new era emerged in Anglo-Turkish relations. The victory of the British Labour Party in 1945 opened the door to the Middle East for the Americans. The Afghan government asked the United States to take over aid to Greece and Turkey in particular, as it could no longer afford the enormous financial outlay. In 1947, the Turks reformed, uh, reaffirmed, sorry, the importance of the Anglo-Turkish alliance, which was as strong as ever, and praised the services Britain had rendered, rendered them in the past. Turkey fully understood that Britain was no longer available and able to fulfill all, all its obligations, and had to ask the United States to do so in its place. On the 18th of February 1952, Turkey became a NATO member together with Greece. 14, the 14th of October 52 was a special day for the Anglo-Turkish relations. It was the first time since the founding of the Republic that Turkish Prime Minister, a uh, Turkish Prime Minister, Adnan Menderes, paid an official visit to Britain. Menderes wanted to make it clear to his interlocutors that Turkey did not want to become more dependent on US military aid. However, the British Labour Party disagreed and argued that it was Turkey's interest to cooperate more with the United States. On the 26th of July 1956, the Suez Canal was nationalized by Egypt. As soon as Nasser decided to nationalize the Suez Canal, the Turks re reacted unfavorably and together with Britain and the US con condemned this unilateral act. The Turkish government believed that Egypt's unilateral control of the canal could lead to a Soviet seizure of Suez, posing a serious threat to Western security. On the 9th of, 29th of October of the same year, the United Kingdom, France and Israel launched a military operation against Egypt. Turkey, although not involved in the Middle East um, conflict, was at an impasse due to its role in the Baghdad Pact and its relations with the US and the UK. The Turkish call for the British withdrawal from the canal was a reluctant move which favoured its most important ally, the US, at the expense of Britain. This in turn reflected the fact that the US had taken over British responsibility for backing Turkey militarily and economically since 1947. The 1956 Suez crisis was a test case for Turkey's Middle East policy. Turkey did not have too much experience in the region inherited from the legacy of the Kemalist foreign policy, um, and therefore did not seem to show too much interest in the uh, political structures and goals of its neighbours in the Middle East. As far as Anglo-Turkish relations were concerned, everything went relatively well between 1957 and 1959. The news London received from Ankara was quite reassuring following the Zurich-London agreements which laid down the policies and constitution of the future Republic of Cyprus. Nevertheless, the British government began to worry about Turkey's political stability. On the 22nd of April 1960, the British ambassador in Ankara, Sir Bernard Burroughs, informed Selwyn Lloyd, the British Foreign Secretary, that there was a potentially revolutionary situation. The Turkish army seized control on the 27th of May 1960. The president and ministers were taken into custody and Menderes, who was arrested a few days later, is reported to have told his captors, I wish you luck, gentlemen. This is what Sir Bernard Burroughs wrote in his book, Diplomat in a Changing World. My first knowledge of what was happening came when I received a telephone call very early in the morning from the security guard at our offices next to the <coughs> embassy residence which was very close to the presidential palace on the hill of Chankaya. The guard told me that he could see from within our compound 
that the presidential palace was surrounded by tanks. I asked him which way the guns were pointing, and he said inwards. This made it clear what was happening, and I think my report to London for once out outpaced the earliest news reports which were sent by journalists. The coup was immediately successful and virtually bloodless. The Turkish revolution of the 27th of May 1960 remained faithful to all the international alliances that Turkey had signed. And the second coup in Turkey took place on the 12th of March 1971. From the 18th of October to the 25th of October 1971, another major event in Anglo-Turkish relations took place. Turkey, on the brink of both economic and political crisis, was hosting Queen Elizabeth II of England for the second time after the visit of her uncle Edward VIII in September 1936. This royal visit was the result of an invitation made by the Turkish president, Cevdet Sunay, during his visit to London in November 67. The Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh and Princess Anne visited Turkey before attending the anniversary celebrations of the Persian monarchy in, in Iran. And on the 12th of September 1980, the third revolution took place in Turkey. Seven months later, on the 27th of April 1981, Sir Ian Gilmer, the Lord Privy Seal, became the first minister from Western government to pay an official visit to Ankara. He stated that the British government was aware of the appalling circumstances Turkey faced when the military seized power the previous September and expressed his full confidence that dem democracy would soon return to Turkey. And with this, I would like to conclude part one of my lecture. Anglo-Turkish relations have been through political conflicts, diplomatic maneuverings and economic difficulties over the centuries. But the spirit of cordial relations between the two countries has survived. Turkey's strict or active neutrality during the Second World War was sharply criticized by both the Allies and the Axis powers. It cannot be overlooked that with Ataturk's enthusiasm and the help of the Turkish and British ambassadors, Turkey managed to restore relations with Britain. Despite its criticism, the British government was well aware that Turkish neutrality had prevented the conflict from spreading to the Middle East. In the post-war period, however, the British had been replaced in the Middle East by the Americans, continued to be present in Turkey. <clears throat> now in this second part, I will talk about the Cyprus conflict. On the 4th of June 1878, the Cyprus Convention was signed and Britain entered that part of the Mediterranean to occupy and administer the island with the consent of Sultan Abdul Hamid. The aim of the British Conservatives was to prevent Russian expansion <coughs> and thus mm -hmm. protect the Ottomans, but also to closely monitor the route to India. During the First World War, the Turks were the allies of the Germans, and on the 5th of November 1914, Britain declared to place the, and decided to place the island under the British crown. Immediately after, the Greek Cypriots began to put pressure on the British to unite the island with Greece. This was the beginning of the struggle for Enosis, unification mm -hmm. with Greece. British politicians had promised in their political speeches to cede Cyprus to Greece, but these promises were never kept. So Cyprus became a crown colony in 1925. Turkey kept quiet out of respect for the island's new owner. But as the Enosists increased their pressure, the Turks also began to make their voices heard. 1954, Cyprus became a tripartite British, Greek, Turkish affair, and then an international affair when Greece, seeking self-determination for Cyprus, made a formal application to the United Nations. This was the beginning of a real intercommunal conflict. In 1955, the anti-communist and pro-Hellenic National Organization of Cypriot Fighters, IOKA, 
uh, founded by General, General Grivas. intensified its fire violence against the British administration of the island and also against Turkish Cypriots who sided with the British. To the violence of the Greek Cypriots, the, Greek, uh, the Turkish Cypriots in turn responded with violence by forming a terrorist group called Volkan. The pogrom of the 6th to the 7th of September 1955, also known as the Istanbul riots or the September events, were a series of state-sponsored anti-Greek mob attacks in Istanbul and Izmir, which took on unexpected proportions with looting and tax on shops belonging to the Greek minority, but also Armenians and Jews. Cemeteries were damaged, churches were burned, etc., etc. The rumor of a bomb had been planted in Atatürk's birthplace in Thessaloniki, Greece, triggered the demonstrations and led to uncontrollable outbursts. All this was totally unfounded and, to use a modern term, fake. In a telegram dated the 16th of September 1955, French ambassador to Turkey, referring to the events of the 6th and 7th September, said, I have the feeling that there is a growing tendency here to attribute responsibility for the deplorable events of the 6th of September to the political mistakes of the British. The ambassador mentioned the Turkish Foreign Minister Zorlu's telegram addressed to Menderes was asking him to support the Turkish cause in Cyprus, which triggered off the riots. In 1956, terrorism was on the rise in Cyprus. Therefore, Harold Millen's government took the highly controversial decision to deport Archbishop Macarius to the Seychelles. He was not allowed to return to Cyprus until 1959. Um, I once came across a document in the, in the French archive saying that Prince Philip had put pressure on the Macmillan government, but I could not find the document when I back, went back to the archives. So I don't know where the document is. <coughs> His activities gave the British Macarius activities the British authorities sufficient reason to exile him to the Seychelles for a year, along with three other Greek Cypriot nationalists. The first thing that occurred was a sudden change of accommodation due to the fact that the place that he and his three fellow exiles were intended to stay in was called La Bastille. This was unacceptable to the British because of the negative prison connotations associated with the name, so they insisted that another place be found. The governor, under immense pressure, had to use his own house at Sans Souci, and it eventually became, or they called it, Macarius House. The Archbishop spent his days reading, studying scriptures and English. He established the Macarius Fund, which assisted students to afford their education. He planned to return to the Seychelles and was having a house built for his retirement. But the invasion of Cyprus by Turkey in 1974 of the plans only and um, re and he revisited the Seychelles once more in 1975 before his death on August the 3rd 1977. In 1959 at the Zurich conference and later at the London conference Cyprus became an independent republic within the Commonwealth with Archbishop Macarius a Greek Cypriot as president and um, a Turkish Cypriot Dr. Fazal Kuchik as vice president. The new republic was not to enjoy lasting peace. The violence continued until the 15th of July 1974, when the Macarius government was overthrown by Greek officers who were part of the Cypriot National Guard. Archbishop Macarius was taken by helicopter from his stronghold at Paphos to the, to the British sovereign base in Akrotiri and then flown to Malta by the Air Force aircraft. On the 8th of October 1974, at a reception <coughs> um, at a reception at the Egy Egyptian Embassy, Lebanese Ambassador El Dior told Zeki Kunaral, Ambassador of Turkey to Spain, that while in London last August, he sat at a dinner with the Foreign Secretary Callan, and Callan had twice told him he emphatically 
um, taught him emphatically that his sympathies lay with the Turks in the Cyprus conflict. On the 15th of October 1974, this is what Zeki Kunaral, ambassador of Turkey to Spain, wrote in his diplomatic notebooks. I met Julian Amory, British Conservative Party politician, MP and minister, and at the party given by Wade uh, Gary, the minister, councillor, British embassy, Amory saw also Makarios in London. Makarios, he says, seems now to have realised that the British sovereign areas may be useful. Amory said he does not expect Britain to give up give them up. On the 14th of August 1975, Sir Bernard Barrows and his family stayed for one night at the Turkish Embassy in Spain. Talking about Cyprus, Barrows said that the first Turkish landing was accepted by the British public, but the second one less. The looting of the villages of the British residents in Cyprus made an especially unfavourable impression. The Turks divided the island in half, and in 1975, Rantash, the leader of the Turkish Cypriot community, became president of the Turkish Federated State of Cyprus. Antony Ackland, the British ambassador to Spain, visited Zeki Kunaral on the 18th of July, 1978, and talking about Cyprus, Ackland said that he thought Makarios was indeed a clever politician, and certainly not a man of God. <laughs> he should have abstained of persecuting the Turkish minority. On the contrary, the Turks being a minority, he should have shown himself generous towards them. It was Dentash, later in 1983, proclaimed the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is recognized only by Turkey. Now, one last, um, one last uh, excerpt concerning the 1940, 1974 coup and invasion, which I unearthed in the French archives. It's in the book now. Um, I read as follows. On the 14th of August, 1974, a telegram from the French ministry, the subject, the Americans in the Cyprus affair, reads, Several members of the Karamanlis government assure us that the Americans did indeed play an important role together with the Greek military junta in the outbreak of the Cyprus affair. We knew this, but now we've got the proof. Archbishop Makarios had indeed become the black beast of the American services. Mr. Kissinger is said to have approved the overthrow of the Archbishop. Senior Greek officers complained to the Defence Minister about the actions of the United States, which had invited them to carry out the Cyprus operation, only to abandon them later. For his part, Mr. Karamanis is angry because they forced Greece to go to Geneva when the strict application of the previous Cyprus agreements of 1960 would have been sufficient to guarantee integrity and independence. <clears throat> By giving itself the freedom to choose a conciliatory role in Cyprus, Britain remembering the recent past in Cyprus and Northern Ireland had managed not to involve its troops again in a hopeless struggle. And so Britain decided to lay down the burden it had inherited from the Turks in 1878. And to end talk, I'd like to read a poem which was written by Lino Spiteri, a Maltese author and politician who had attended the 39th Commonwealth Parliamentary Congress held in Cyprus in September 1993. On the other side, I wish to feel the shade of the carob tree on the other side soothe my body, to drive through the land, roam the streets, speak with friends I could make on the other side, but I cannot. In Aphrodite's island, so beautiful, so friendly, so sadly divided, today I cannot. 
and why, so it remains in this great new world, I do not understand. Nicosia, 6th of September, 1993. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful, clear, yeah. 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 absolutely yeah. Um, yeah. core to the interests of our society. Isn't it? It's all in the book, right? Well, it's only 30, 30 pages here, but 365 pages there. <laughs> Oh, it's Bertrand Burroughs used to like telling that story, but, uh, the story about the turrets. But I'm trying to remember, surely, wasn't the point that the, the turrets of the tanks were pointing away from the embassy? I think this is the point he was trying to make, defending them in case there was any difficulty. More trying to make sure that... Uh... In other words, protecting the embassy rather than, rather than um, uh, as it were, incurring a pocket, entering into the embassy compound. I'm not quite sure whether that came across, but that's right, isn't it? That, 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 that they were facing away from the embassy. Yes. Or, or towards the presidential palace. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Because they're very close to each other. Next to each other. Yes, 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 yes absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I walked past the 1980s thinking a couple of mortar bombs lobbed from the road, and that would be it. And the security yes. was almost, almost zero at that time. Uh, very, and very strange. Yeah. Terribly in those days. In those days, no, it was, a, yeah, it was just a symbolic position. Yeah, yeah exactly. Anyway, um, uh, I'm sure that there will be there will be many people interested in asking asking questions about this. The point about the Cicero affair, though, as far as I understand it, is that the is that Hitler didn't believe the information in his coterie. Um, they thought it was too good to be true, and so it must be in a Germany. Mm, yes, but um, I think it was from from Papen who sort of managed to get the the reels sent to Germany. He insisted on. The Germans to accept the reels and pay the money, but the money was it wasn't counterfeit mm. money yeah. anyway. That's right. Yes. And there's a whole book on the counterfeit money. Mm. Being, actually, the, the counterfeiter who wrote the book. So that's very interesting. Yes. Well, there's several different books about it. Mm -hmm. I have occasionally asked Germans about this, and they get quite cross because they still regard it as being something which one doesn't read to have in public, even though it was. 70 years ago, they refused to talk about it. There was even a film like that. Yes, yes, yes. yes but the film. Ages ago, with James Mason. Yes, James Mason, but the was film he... is, is far away from reality. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Ages ago. Mm. 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 I don't think it makes any difference. They, they regard this as a matter of, 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 of national security. Oh, oh, oh really? Yeah. German academics are civil servants, and they just said they're not going to talk But it's strange it. that uh, the valet was not vetted because he used to work for the Germans before. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the things we mm -hmm. do relaxed about these mm -hmm. But apparently, Sir Hugh was extremely worried about this this event. Extremely mm -hmm. worried mm -hmm. until his death. Mm -hmm. Well, any questions for our, our speaker? Either about Cyprus or about Anglo-Turkish relations? Or, or comments? I don't know who's on the screen, Craig. Can you see who's on, online? Yeah, well, Julian's online. Julian's online. And we have a few more. Let's have a look. Who we got? That's not Dankash, um, is it? Is that it was. Yes. Yes. Well, well, we got uh, no, no, I don't Alan Christopher, Maratou Shiptar, Judy Miller, Ewan B. Bojan Kanko, Kozlan. Yes. So we've got about we have seven people online. So if anybody wants online to ask a question, feel free. Always put your hand up if if, the, if you're um you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Yes, you know Bernard Burroughs was, was chairman of this society. Was he? Yeah. 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 Mm. He welcomed me for the first talk I gave to the society. He just like I I have a question. I've got a hope this. I uh, thank you for organizing this wonderful, informative event. I am really a big fan of Mustafa Kamal Atatürk and Mr. Kamal Pasha. I guess he helped Turkey to be more up to date with the modern government system, which was not before the Second World War. And he was kind of revolutionary. And maybe for his uh, works, Turkey became a more of a secular state or country of all religions of after the Second World War. So how do you consider this leader, Mustafa Kamal Atatürk or Mustafa Kamal Pasha, as a 
clever politician or man of God or man of time? How do you explain his uh, effect on the modern Turkey? Is that is that question clear? No. no. Yes. Uh, our our, 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 our um, uh, friend online is saying, what is the legacy of Ataturk in today's Turkey, in effect? Oh, today's Turkey. Yes. 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 <laughs> he had a different approach, I mean, which uh, yes, people respected and went on using. But do you think the legacy is, is there in some respects still? Peace. Oh. Yes. Well, it is. Yes, the, the ideal is still embedded in the system, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Despite everything. Yes, which is a very good thing. <laughs> Did the um, British use the Turkish minority to do some of the dirty work, for example, the police force in Cyprus? Did that make the situation worse in Cyprus, you think? Because, I mean, I get the impression they were using similar tactics as they did in India, where they mm -hmm. again employed minorities, like the Sikhs and stuff, to quell nationalist forces there. So, I, you know, maybe for specific actions. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking perhaps they were. Uh, Wouldn't come across any. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. In broad terms, could the British have done better in Cyprus? Of course. In what way do you think the British attitude would have been improved, or actions would have been better? They could have treated the Greeks and the, and the, and the Turks on the equal footing. Mm -hmm. I mean, now that I've done all this work, I, I really feel sorry for the Greeks and the Turks. Both Greeks and Turks mm -hmm. on the island. Mm -hmm. So what could they have done specifically, though, that would have would have been well, they could have listened a bit more to the Turks and listened a bit more to the Greeks, mm -hmm. and they could have forgotten about the uh, union with Greece and concentrated on the island alone. Mm -hmm. to help the island to, to survive a better life. I don't know. Mm -hmm. They could have been. Uh, they could have been nicer. Mm -hmm. well, it's difficult. If you I mean, if you remember, if you remember the. Um, the memoirs, for example, of Storrs, which I'm sure you've read. He basically woke up one day and found his his um, governing government house burned down. It's very difficult to know what to do. It is. It's so, not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah. Mm. But especially in Macarius, he could have done something. I'm sure. Mm. But also, after the coup, after the, uh, after 1974, I, I have the impression he was a bit nicer to the Turks. He was more open mm. towards the Turks. That's the impression I got before his death and after the coup, after the coup and before his death. Mm. Things were improving a bit. But then he died. It's terribly difficult to know what to do with two sides are fighting over the same piece of land. This is a fundamental problem. It's what they say in Zephyr, top hat covers it. It's incredibly difficult this. It, 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 it is a zero sum game. Because they could have been lived in peace. I'm, I'm sure they could have lived in peace mm -hmm. in the villages and. Uh, which they were doing. Which they were. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So Britain probably manipulated, as I said, the Turkish government and the Greek government and um, upset the whole situation. At the time of the invasion by Turkey in 74. I believe Britain was asked to interfere and do something, and the answer was from the Foreign Office. This is an ex UK ambassador, to, I can't remember his name now. And Britain apparently said they are both NATO members, we couldn't possibly interfere. Mm. Yes, we you certainly can have Callaghan declined. Um, yes, do, you want to talk, do you want to talk a little bit about the refusal of the British to fulfill their obligation? Because that's always been the Turkish point. Yes, the, I read in a document yes. that Kalan didn't, didn't want to intervene because he said, anyway, we can't go back to the 1960 agreement. It didn't work. So why waste time and go back again to the 1960 agreement? And that's why he didn't want to sort of do much with the, to, to sort of negotiate with the uh, Turks. 
Yes. Now, Britain still holds two big bases. Mm. What's all that about? I mean, I mean, is it a, a leftover from their clone days? So, I mean, what's the benefit for the for the Cypriot government? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it's, it's more benefit to the Americans in dropping mm -hmm. on what's happening in Israel. I think so. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Borrowing a present into Iraq, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. in the past. Yes, it was a yeah. expanding to all yeah. anywhere. You know, it's really it's a, yeah. without the pressure to to cede those. I think they've been mm -hmm. very careful to hold on to those. And they, mm -hmm. there's been some negotiation, as I understand, latterly for in the event of the latter discussions between the both sides of the island, the Anan clan, there was some talk of relinquishing a small parcel of that as a real gesture of arable land on mm -hmm. those bases, but the bulk of them they were not willing they are not willing to mm -hmm. a bit like David Garcia, effectively. Mm -hmm. So that's too strategically important to borrow more to for that matter. Okay, there's a lady on online here to ask a question. Uh, you do you go ahead. Go ahead, Chida. Unmute yourself please. Unmute. Oh, sorry. Oh. Hi. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. Uh, um, yes, I'm amazed. Um, <laughs> in any of the documents that you were looking through, did you come across communication pointing to the um, that claimed by some quarters fact? Um, that Turkey actually got the blessing of England and America for the invasion. And they gave their blessing on the grounds that they would not take sides or take part, but good luck to Turkey. Did you ever come across anything like this? I haven't, but um, I can imagine that they had Kissinger's blessing. I mean, so that's I, had I, haven't come, I haven't come across documents, but I can imagine that they had Kissinger's blessing because maybe the Americans wanted to have, um, once the Turkish, uh, the Turks had had more territory, they could have asked the Turks to have more bases on the Turkish side. I mean, I'm trying to imagine, but I haven't come across any documents. The only document is the document I read out from the Karamanlis government. That's the only one I found. But I'm going to go back to the archives in Paris and see if I can find more. Mm. more but I haven't come across that particular aspect of things, but I can imagine that Kissinger dragged a bit and, uh, to let the Turks move on, move on, move on, and have uh, maybe one day yeah. more places. I, what I had heard from the um, authorities, um, who, who were um, in government at the time, that they were very surprised when America acted later on in terms of sanctions in the way it did, because they had Americans, uh, Americas and the British, um, they, they knew about it and they had their blessing. Didn't Johnson ban them from using any kind of uh, in 1964 weapons. in 19, uh, that was, was in 1964 when they blocked the Turks from invading Cyprus mm. but to come back to what you said may, maybe maybe we, we might find the answer in, in the WikiLeaks are we allowed to use the WikiLeaks officially <laughs> because <laughs> I mean, yeah, if, they're, if they're on the internet I, I, see, yeah. yes but I mean are we allowed to quote them mm. Um, knowing what's happening to the yes. gentleman who's in prison, yes. because I, I I I I had a look at the WikiLeaks. There are terrible things in those documents. Mm -hmm. yeah. really? I mean, uh, the general uh, brigadier Ioannidis getting very angry, smashing the windows and breaking glasses and dishes because Kissinger pushed him into invading Cyprus and then dropped him like a hot brick. Mm -hmm. The WikiLeaks give all these in detail that he was wow. smashing, smashing things in the room in front of everybody. Are we allowed to quote these? 
officially. I don't know. But there are things in Wikileaks. Please go to Wikileaks and have a look. Wow. If, if that can help. Yeah, the Pal American just was introduced to Dirty. I mean, the, the, the area which I've always thought that the, the Turks had external approval for was the 1980 intervention. Um, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm pretty clear in my mind that, that, that if, if anything, they waited in 1980 until, until, until the NATO, particularly Britain and America, were almost saying, it, really, it's always, you know, you're almost a bit late in uh, intervening now. But that's what, I've not heard the Cyprus one make, uh, uh, indicated so much. So it's rather strange now that the 1980 was regarded as being an inappropriate event when it had very strong external support and internal support as well. well. There's also another approach to things. Um, apparently there was a problem between Kissinger, the CIA and the other people, the, the American ambassador in Greece information was not going the right way all the time. Yeah. Mm. There was this as well. Misunderstandings, they call them. Mm. Mm. But the sovereign basis, I assume, Britain has always said to the, the Greeks, you know, whatever you do, you just don't get near the sovereign basis. And that, will, that will be, uh, yeah. And so it must be very clear in our thoughts that we have different, different kinds of priorities in the island. Almost conflicted interests. But on the other hand, you had Cypriot workers and Turkish workers who used to work oh, in the yeah. basis. And they worked peacefully. Yeah. <clears throat> From what I heard. Well, I generally think it got out of control. See, the, have you looked at the parallel of the Crete um, situation, where, of course, Innos has worked in Crete? I think one, I was very strong in the Greek imagination before. And two, also, the British are regarded as being rather supine in allowing Crete to be taken completely over in the way that it did, with resulting in very substantial loss. But there was only one community in Crete. One, no, lots and lots, lots and lots of Turks and Greeks. Lots. They got they got wiped out. Many of them had to flee to Turkey. The rest of them got killed. This was late nineteenth century. Late nineteenth century. Absolutely no. It was, yeah. it was a very very serious yeah. breakdown. Mm -hmm. and, and this must have been in both sides' minds. Yeah. One in the one in the in the, in the Greek minds. And they said, we got Crete, therefore we can get Cyprus. And of course, in the Turks' minds, they were determined not to allow that to happen again. You could add Rhodes, maybe, because not Rhodes joined Greece in 1947, was it? But that was, as far as I know, no, that was 1945, after the Second World War, was it? Was it? It, it was, was Italian, Italian, wasn't it? Rhodes and the, the, yeah. the 12 yeah. islands were Italian. The Japanese, yes. Yeah. 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 But that was, that was regarded as being less significant. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying, from the Greek imagination is like, okay, so we got Crete, oh, so we, got, yeah. we got Rhodes, next Cyprus, I think. I don't know. You see, see, Peter Louisos, I think it was, told me that when he was doing field work in Greece, it might have been one of the other anthropologists working in Greece, said that they were collecting money uh, from the villagers to send to the forces in, in Cyprus with this very, very strong nationalistic idea that, that, that our troops there need support. Uh, Mobilisation, in other words, uh, volunteers. But maybe things intensified in Cyprus because all, <clears throat> all those British politicians were promised to give Cyprus to Greece, to unite Cyprus with mm -hmm. Greece, they didn't keep their promise. So um, maybe that made people angry. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's difficult. You get politicians of different parties, isn't it? They don't necessarily speak as the states. Yeah. 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 And in 1964, um, a big portion of this time the Greek community got expelled. Would, you know, the, the angry community, shall we say, came to Greece and that probably poisoned the atmosphere further because they, they were given 48 hours notice. They could only carry one suitcase. And some of them were literally dumped on the border and no money had to be rescued. So all this didn't help the Turkish Greek relationships <coughs> as well. Indeed, even in Turkey today, the, 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 these ancient minorities are growing ever less, not more. Um, 
course, now there's a very large uh, Syrian Arab refugee community, which is the exact opposite, but that's a different, mm. uh, different mm. matter. How was your work being received? How was your work being received? Me? Your book? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't had a report from Sinan. <laughs> <coughs> no, but I must tell you that the book is in French. Yeah. It's not in English. Mm -hmm. The footnotes are in English and in French for the simple reason that when you do a doctorate in France, mm -hmm. by law, mm -hmm. it's yeah, got to be in French. Yes. I think that it's changing now. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I remember doing my MA in Paris as well, but I was allowed to do it in English. Mm -hmm. It was on Turkish foreign policy, and then I modified the, the subject. Mm -hmm. But the doctorate has to be uh, written in French. Mm -hmm. But I managed to put in footnotes in English as well. And my supervisor, who's a, who's a British person, said there's no need to translate them, and I was very happy. Mm -hmm. So I have no, no feedback from, from Sinan. I'm still not a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> What's the title of your book? Anglo Turkish Relations, 1939 to 1980, and the Cyprus Conflict. Is it possible in a future an English version? Yes. Well, well, who's going to translate it? I mean, mm. the publisher's got to be somebody to. Sure. Mm. sure. Mm. Is this in French then? It's in French. Mm. With footnotes in English and in French. Mm. Initially, it was 990 pages. Mm. Gosh. Mm. Well, because I, I had a second volume and I'm, I'm sending Craig all the, the files for you to um, uh, see them. I had, the, I had the chronology of events based on all the articles published in the Times of London and the Sunday Times, or the Daily Telegraph coming in when the Times was on strike. So that was a long preparation. But no computers when I did that. Mm -hmm. I had to write down everything on yeah. cards and then, you know, yeah. so a whole, vo a whole volume on that. So somebody doing research in Turkey can, can read the article and uh, he's got the page number, the call number, the date. And nowadays, if you pay nine pounds, nine, sorry, nine euros a year, you have access to the Times Index on the internet. So if you, if you take my chronology, you can just type in the title of the article, the date, and the article comes up on, onto the screen. And there was a volume on diplomatic anecdotes, uh, maps, cartoons, photographs. That was part of the doctorate. Amazing. How mm. long did it take you from sort of, you know, <laughs> the first sentence to the time you defended? Um, it took me 12 years. Yes. Now, normally, yes. normally in France, it's all by law, you know, mm. in France, it's um, three to four years, but then you can get an extension. Mm. As I was teaching at the same time, I was teaching 35 hours a week, which was oh, a wow. lot. Oh, wow. And I was publishing as well, because I published her books, uh, prepositions and phrasal verbs and things like that, textbooks in English. My supervisor gave me an extension. Then the law changed and it was a new doctorate format which came into uh, effect and then I had another four years. So all in all it was 12 years. Yeah. And there were, I, I didn't have a computer in those days, it was an yeah. electric typewriter yeah. yes. and you couldn't, you couldn't use the machine for more than half an hour because it went Came all hot and in, 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 in a time. <laughs> that <laughs> was the good old days. The good old days. Great. There are two messages on the chat. Oh, is there any? Could just say one question. Yeah. Thank you for organizing the event. So yeah, we've um, we've already had that um, question by Fardouche. So Fardouche, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. Well, I think if there are no more questions, we can just thank our speaker for yeah. a most illuminating yes. overview. Yes. Thank you very much.